This nation was founded on the principle that all men are created equal. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men. That all men are, are created, created equal. I'll tell you what freedom is to me. No fear. I mean, really, no fear. It's a death. From WDET in Detroit, this is Created Equal. I'm Stephen Henderson, and I'm sitting in our studio with the show's producer, Carrie Jr. II. Hello. So, Carrie, if I say the phrase racial ghosts to you, mm-hmm. what comes to mind? Uh, racial ghosts. I, I think of racist ghosts, but I'm sure that's not what you're actually <laughs> referring yeah, to. Yeah, that's the that would be the literal <laughs> translation of that. It's not really what I'm thinking of or Ooh. what I mean, right? Uh, I, I, I'm talking about the imprints of the nation's racial history, the, the, the weight of all the things that have happened before we're born mm-hmm. and, and how they play out on us in our lives and in our minds once we are born, this idea that uh, there's a little bit of destiny, I right. guess, involved with uh, with the choices we make and the things we do. Uh, that's what we want to talk about today on the show. And we've got a really interesting guest who has been writing and thinking a lot about this. That is correct. Uh, our guest is Dr. Dion Powell. She is a training and supervising psychoanalyst at Columbia University. And, you know, I, I know what we were talking about to the racial ghost, but I do feel like that phrase is kind of funny to me. Like the racial <laughs> ghost, it just, that's what I see in my head, like an animated silly ghost. You see the actual ghost. <laughs> an oversimplification, in my opinion, of what I think racial ghosts are is like internalized racism. I, I mean, that's a phrase I think more people are familiar with, a phrase that I think when we when I hear casual conversation about how we're impacted by being othered in some way. And so I was really interested to hear Dr. Powell's uh, perspective on how we internalize the, the impact of things like racism and how we are altered by it. Um, because it's really an interesting approach to talk about mm-hmm. the internal impacts, not just the external and systemic causes um, that we are frequently discussing on this show. Yeah, I'm excited to have this conversation. I think the question of how, if all these things are true, how we move past them is Mm -hmm. one of the things I really want to get to. So let's get to the conversation. And Carrie, for this show, you're going to join me in a conversation with Dr. Powell. Dr. Dion Powell... Welcome to Created Equal. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to start here. What are racial ghosts? Explain that phrase to me. Mm, Okay. Um, When we're born, we've had nine months inside of a person, our moms. And, you know, whatever the mom was born when, when... the mom has gone throughout her life with the egg that becomes you and I. Right. Right. And so that any kind of uh, trauma, generational trauma, actual trauma, depression, mental illness, addiction, growing up in a war zone, growing up in a poverty situation. All of those features have a way of uh, impacting that child, you and I. Because because we're present inside our mothers from the beginning of their lives. From the beginning of their lives as an egg, and mm-hmm. then in beginning in our of our lives right. as a as a fetus that becomes a baby that becomes delivered. So, so to go back to your bad analogy, it's essentially that the the uh, understanding of how to survive uh, as that species is passed along from mother to child, so that the child comes out ready. Ready to survive. Ready to absorb. Ready ready to to engage. Okay. And we call it labor because it is an act of labor to be born. 
right? And so, so those initial interactions, a baby can make out their mother's face within 30 days of life. Mm-hmm. They already know how she sounds, right? So they're cued in to that mother's responses, emotions, affects. They don't know what to describe it as, right? They don't, they don't have language yet. But let's say that mother is depressed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Let's say that mother is the product, uh, has had some tr- traumas in her life. Those, the way she engages with her child may be imbued with all of those traumas Mm -hmm. in spite of herself. It's certainly shaped by them, right? Right. It's shaped by her and those micro interactions. Remember, children are supercomputers. We haven't even gotten to the point of developing something like a child's mind and brain. Mm -hmm. So if, if there's a transgenerational history of trauma that could be racial, that could be from war, that could be from the Holocaust, that could be from being in poverty situations, it could be from sexual trauma, it could be from mental illness, it could be from addiction. The mother's interaction will shape the child. Right. And so you see films of mothers with babies and the mother might be depressed, but when she looks at the baby, she has a smile on her face. that's really sort of quick and, Mm -hmm. and in some ways startling. And then when she's thinking that the baby's not looking at her, her face could become pinched and, in all consumed by whatever's going on in her mind, the mother's mind. The baby sees this and reaches out for the mother, attempting to get her to be warm and fuzzy, right? This is all we got. We don't have bat wings. Right. Um, And depending on that interaction over and over again, certain things get inside our minds about who to fear, why we fear, in a way that we don't even have language to put it at. Right. And so to put that in a, in a racial context, then, uh, the discrimination that a mother might experience, the, the, the historic discrimination that she might have heard about in her family, uh, right. all passes on in a in a, a subconscious i guess way i mean this is right. not intentional you're talking about right this is not intentional it gets communicated very early it gets communicated very early but without words hmm. and then certain things happen like we go to school and someone says i can't play with you because of who you are mm-hmm. and we begin to define a kind of otherness. You're in my group. You're not in my group. And some of that is, is conveyed even within one's home. If you begin hearing, for instance, like let's say the N-word, or mm-hmm. you hear something that's anti-Semitic, or if you hear something that's against uh, particular uh, sexuality, and you, you, you begin to take these things inside. And of course, your parents are loving you and trying to protect you. And with 400 years of systemic racism, slavery, mm. Jim Crow, lynching, there's a kind of embeddedness to uh, how we... Uh, are conveying who the other is and who to be afraid of right. or weary of or cautious around. So, no. so in, in, in some ways, and this is, I mean, uh, in, in some ways, the assessment you're making here uh, suggests that it's impossible, impossible to 
exist as an African American without the weight of all that history on your shoulders. And and that's a really bold idea to think about, right? Uh, all the things we want to believe about self-determination, all the things we want to believe about uh, uh, progress and, and independence and freedom, they kind of crumble at the, at the altar of what you're talking about, right? Like, well, maybe yes and maybe no. It really does depend on, A, the mother, the, uh, the, the caretakers, and how they've dealt with it. Because mm-hmm. in addition, we, 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 you, know, you know, black people, African-Americans have had to have tremendous resilience, right? Yes. In order to be Just able to survive, to, yeah, <laughs> survive and, and also thrive, yeah. thrive. I mean, we, we 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 you know, in certain instances, a lot of folks have been able to, you know, bring themselves up, want to bring up other people, and provide a context in which the child can experience the world. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's overdone. It's it's hard to get a balance, especially if the person has their own internalized fears and anxieties that they haven't actually worked through. I'm curious. So I don't, I'm not saying that, that, that every Mm. child is bearing the weight of 400 years. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. You know, that would seem almost impossible. We would not (laughs) be able to live, but we've had certain ways of expressing our pain through the Mm. blues, through the church, through, through other connections, fraternities, sororities, just being able to engage with other people who are considered the other mm. and not have have some of those fears mitigated through reality, mm. through relationships, right? Yeah. Dr. Pa, I want to, what, uh, what other examples are there of parents passing along these ghosts that exemplify, like, what these ghosts look like and manifest? I know you gave the example about, you know, the mother and her face, but are there other verbal like behaviors that were taught at a young age that also are in alignment with what you're talking about? Yeah, I think, I mean, going back a couple of decades, the whole idea of what to do in the South if you're Black and you're walking on the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. You know, certain people are, you know, were instructed if a white person is coming along, step off the sidewalk. Um, and for a young child, they may not know what the, what the parents referring to. Now, mm-hmm. hopefully you give some context of, of why you might need to step off the sidewalk. Mm-hmm. If you look at what's recently happened in the world from, you know, driving while or walking while black, <laughs> Right. So you're, you're, you're Trayvon Martin. You're visiting your stepfather. You're not known to the community. You go to 7-Eleven. You're looking forward to the NBA All-Star game. You buy some Skittles and a soda. You're talking to your girlfriend on your cell phone. It begins to rain. You pull up your hoodie. In another car is someone seeing someone who's not familiar with the neighborhood. He isn't familiar to the neighborhood. He's visiting his, his, his father. Mother lives in Miami, I think. And a whole interaction begins based on the person in the car's thoughts about the person that's walking on the street. Mm-hmm. So that usually typically leads to conversations where you have to inject a kind of fear mm-hmm. that you can't you have to be mindful, especially if you're in a foreign neighborhood. I mean, I think it's reflected in the film Get Out by Jordan Peele so well. That You have to be mindful that you can't be a normal kid mm-hmm. if you're, for instance, Tamir Rice in a park playing with a plastic gun. Right. And, and so that kind of fear gets sort of put in people, and sometimes to the point where it gets, it, it's almost... It scares the child. Mm. They're scared of the environment. Scared of the environment, scared of being out, scared of being playful. 
been scared of being yourself. Scared of being oneself. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're going to t- sort of, go ahead. Mm-hmm. No, and then it gets reinforced over time. If you just look at the news. Okay. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, uh, we're going to continue this conversation with Dr. Dion Powell about racial ghosts. Stay where you are. We'll be right back with more Created Equal. Hi, it's Terry Gross, the host of Fresh Air. We bring you in-depth, long-form interviews with actors, directors, musicians, authors, journalists, and more. Listen to our Peabody Award-winning Fresh Air podcast from WHYY and NPR. You're listening to Created Equal from WDET in Detroit. I'm Stephen Henderson. I've got the show's producer, Carrie Jr. II, with us. And our guest is Dr. Dion Powell. She is a training and supervising psychoanalyst at Columbia University Center for Psychoanalytic Training and Research and the Psychoanalytic Association of New York. She's also a clinic, uh, clinical assistant professor of psychiatry at Cornell Medical Center in New York City. Uh, okay, so Dr. Powell, we were talking about um not being able to be yourself uh because mm-hmm. of the weight of uh history that gets kind of passed on to us through through conscious and subconscious uh, uh, uh vehicles i guess um uh but how do we decide then who we are and how can we be ourselves as african americans if that's true, if if so much of it is is uh, is almost predetermined, yeah. uh, what what space do we even have to occupy that's ours? Yeah, I mean, I, I this is a really fascinating question because I work individually. I don't work, you know, I don't consider myself a sociologist. Right. I don't tend to work mm-hmm. with groups, but I can just say that. You know, taking the words of Toni Morrison, we are all raced people. Mm -hmm. All of us are raced. Mm -hmm. All of us learn what the other is. And um, a lot of it is really fantasy. I mean, there's no genetic marker for any of these racial categories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? So something, I'm not as worried as much as about the conscious awareness because most people will say I'm I'm not racial I'm not racist and yet the kind of mo- the most inflammatory events of this of this country have been because of a kind of reaction to people who felt like this person of this particular culture and ethnicity is in the wrong spot mm-hmm. at the wrong time mm-hmm. or this town Um, you know, a a prominent Black area, whether that's Tulsa, Oklahoma, or Wilmington, North Carolina, these people are getting a little bit too, like, okay, we're going to have separate equal, but we didn't think they were going to do this well. (laughs) You know? And then then something goes down about that based on something that's almost, you know, almost like a a, 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 just a, a, a slight match to a huge, causing a huge flame. And these things are, are in our unconscious. So our, we consciously walk around and we smolder. We're trying to always work through, you know, I thought people were all the same. And we test that out in our, in our as we develop. Mm-hmm. Just like we learn, you know, cognitively, there's an emotional kind of knowledge that we can begin to address who am I? Who are my people? Being proud of of one's cultural heritage, 
whether you're white. And I don't even understand what white <laughs> means anymore. Right. <laughs> and I don't even understand what black means. I ask people who I work with, who are your people? And then that begins a conversation. And then oftentimes I ask people, tell me about when you were othered the first time, because we usually all have that right. in our minds about being treated like the other. And then once you can do that, I ask, describe you othering someone else, mm -hmm. you being the bully. Most people are much more reluctant to talk about that, mm -hmm. but that's there. And we can always identify it in childhood. So, so you, as you say, you're working on an individual basis, not a, a social a science sort of research basis on these things. What do the people who you're treating tell you about that space, that individual space, how we find that space and how we kind of hide, I guess, from things like racial ghosts? Yeah, I think that what usually what happens is that once people get into treatment, certain patterns come out, mm. you know, patterns that they don't may not like about themselves, mm. um, where they have hurt someone else. It's usually a more sibling relationship or friends or something that broke down. Feel extremely guilty about it. Um, and that sort of deepens a conversation hmm. about how things uh, sort of develop the world that they were living in. For instance, I, I give in my writing and I'm, you know, uh, I, I can't talk about current uh, uh, interactions with patients, sure. but in my writing, I describe as a resident being asked to see a man who was the descendant of a, uh, of uh, someone really high up in the Confederacy who came in after having, came to the hospital after having some strokes. Mm -hmm. And he continued having strokes in the hospital. And at a certain point, he asked to see a psychiatrist. And so I was the psychiatrist who saw him. But before seeing him, I went through his chart and tried to map out, because this was a really good hospital, and it, they didn't understand why he was still having these strokes in the hospital. Mm -hmm. So in looking at and trying to determine when he had it, the strokes, after the, um, the Latinx pulmonologist, lung doctor, came to see him, he had another stroke. Mm. After uh, the South Asian uh, infectious disease doctor came, he had another stroke. Mm -hmm. He asked for a psychiatrist after he had asked for a priest. Mm. And when the uh, Asian priest with his collar came into the room, oh, man. he had another stroke. So at that point, they asked him if he wanted to see a psychiatrist. And he said yes, because he was desperate for something. Now, this was pre-internet. So I, he didn't have these, things, these experiences when he was treated by his, uh, when he was taken for his test, given his meals, which usually were more, were black people who did mm -hmm. that, because mm -hmm. in some ways that fit his mental map. Yeah, understand. That fit his map of where people of certain looks belong. <laughs> Should be, right? Right. <laughs> right. So when I entered the room, he became really flush and diaphoretic, short of breath, beat red. And I said, you know, I, I think I know what's going on. You just want your doctors or your priests to be white. And even me. <laughs> and I watched as he visibly calmed down. Hmm. And it began a series of conversations about him losing friends how, as the world has changed, losing family members, and wanting to be transferred to his ancestral home, mm. anywhere to escape what was happening. Mm. And I said, your, racism is, your mm. racism is really killing you. 
And we had a series of conversations. He was subsequently discharged without any other events happening medically. And I think that for me, that was the first, one of the first time I had other experiences as well, to, to really describe how deeply rooted our fears, right. our anxieties mm -hmm. about the other are. And, it, it, and no one gets a pass. Right. We're all affected. The question is, do we have, when growing up, do we have at our, our, our care providers, our schools, our churches, our mosques, our synagogues, do we have room for conversation to mitigate what might be shared in our growing up mm -hmm. about the other? Right. I, I'm curious to know, Dr. Powell, how deep and how far back othering goes. Do you do you know, I don't want to sound cynical, but is this all learned behavior or is there something about groupings with your group and, and other groups that inherently happens that then when informed by our culture and our society results in these types of perceptions about other people? Yeah, I, I, I think it does go back to whatever our whatever we consider our our grouping. Um, and increasingly it's becoming much more diverse, which is hard to mm -hmm. maintain these kinds of perceptions, right? When you say diverse, um, you mean like different the types society. of groups? Yeah, the different types of groups, okay. the rate of uh, of uh, of integration, the rate of okay. biracial okay. relationships, all, all kinds of things. What okay. you watch on what you watch on television, it used to be only particular people would be in commercials, right? Got you. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, so all of that speaks to a kind of experience that that may be different than how we were raised. I think we we raise our children to feel want them to be safe. We want them to be safe in this world. But part of that safety is a kind of racial safety, mm -hmm. which which happens before words. I, I had mm -hmm. a uh, an experience of walking down the street in my neighborhood and there was a woman with a stroller and her back was to me. And, and I, uh, there was, she had a, a less than a one year old and then less than a two year old, the less than a one year old saw me and we were at, uh, an appropriate distance apart from each other. And see this little baby. I smile, you know, cause I, I like babies. Mm -hmm. And, and so it's a, a white family and, uh, she just, she meets me with this beautiful, brilliant smile. Mm -hmm. The mother turns around at that point, looks at me and goes from a relaxed face to having a pinched, mm. tense face with her, with the older child mimics. Wow. And then the child that was giving me a smile <laughs> seconds ago, she pinches her face too. Mm, that's the moment she learned. Well, I'm not sure if it's learned, but there's something that gets messaged there. Mm. There's a kind of, we call it sort of an enigmatic messaging. That, you know, there, there wasn't a conversation, I don't think, with those children about what they just saw and right. experienced. Mm -hmm. right. And you just think about that happening over and over again. You know, Audrey Lorde writes about being in her uh in her in the supermarket with her daughter and when she was you know sitting in the in the, in the cart and coming along is a, a a white woman with her daughter similar age in a cart and the child points at uh audrey lord's daughter and says look a baby nanny okay mm. oh, so wow so when we think about what gets inside, mm -hmm. I don't think it's like learn. I don't think people are going around with books and, you know, saying that black people are like this and white people are like this and Jewish people are like that. I think that there's something that's much more um, nuanced mm -hmm. that, that happens in this world. And if you're in a society where there's structuralized racism that you really can't talk about. Now, some people choose to talk about it. Some 
parents choose to talk about it with their children. And I think increasingly so to try to demystify Mm -hmm. this kind of structures so that people can try to live their lives in a way that's more authentic. Because I think that our, our, our society superpower is, is within our diversity. Mm. But we have a hard time holding on to that because we have to get to that point considering that we're at a point where we're not feeling that way, where people are, are sort of programmed to feel less than and other people are considered more privileged. Yeah. Um, We're going to take another quick break. And when we come back, we're going to continue this conversation with Dr. Dion Powell. Stay with us for more Created Equal. Equal. I'm Stephen Henderson, and I've got Carrie Jr., the second, the show's producer, in the interview with Dr. Dion Powell of Columbia University with us. Uh, during the break, Dr. Powell had some interesting thoughts that she was sharing with us, and we just jumped right back into the conversation where she wanted to pick up. Yeah, I think because it's so easy to call it racism. It's so hard to understand this concept of how does that get inside? And how do we how do we mitigate what comes inside? Because, you know, we talk about going through adolescent. uh, You know, when we're reconfiguring our relationship with our parents and and the whole thing and and also the whole world. Right. So that. That's also a kind of journey. We don't, we don't just physically grow up. We can also mentally re-examine what we were told, how we were told, and whether that actually comports with how you feel right now. I think when you say racism, too, oftentimes when people have that conversation, they're talking about big systems of you know, choices that were made that impact your ability to make certain choices. But what it sounds like the delineation you're making is this is a behavior, right, that we are internalizing. It's a, it's an observation mm-hmm. that we see in the world that then we, we kind of make part of ourselves. And I, right. I'm curious to know, too, the difference between, because there's two types of inter- internalization I'm understanding, right? There's the behavior that you exhibited that child uh, uh, watching her mother make that face and making that face herself. But then the eternalization of the person, in this case, it's you in the story, yeah. but the othered group, that internalization, it, it may not be the exact same type of behavior, right, that they then exhibit to other people of their same group, but it's still internalized. It is still perpetuated. Mm-hmm. Right, right. So we, we, we teach not in a sit-down book kind of way, mm-hmm. but in our emotional responses yeah. to other people, that's more powerful than, you know, do mm-hmm. as, do as I say, you know, not what I'm telling you. So there was no, uh Oh, was that my fault? I'm sorry. No, you're good. Yeah. You sound good. Okay. Over here. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, you know, being able to, um, explore, A lot of people are getting to this point, too. You know, people who grew up in the South or grew up in being the only one or Mm -hmm. being up, being brought up with things where people are told about people, about who they are, what they're like. And then you have your own experiences. You say, wait a minute. Does this really make sense to me? Mm -hmm. How do you, in your practice, then begin to deconstruct folks who have that mentality. I imagine that's a very difficult task. 
Or is that even really the goal? Is it about like handling the the end symptoms? Well, I mean, the way I mean, I I am a psychoanalyst and I do a lot of psychodynamic psychotherapy, which means I can meet with someone for once a week, twice a week, three times a week, four times a week, um, five times a <laughs> five week. Times a week. <laughs> so, so, so I mean, I, I for for me and and and, and my work. People come in and one, one book that I always like to recommend for people is Stephen Gross's The Examine Life. Mm. And it's, uh, he is a uh, analyst practicing in Great Britain. Mm-hmm. And he has taken about I don't know, 20, 25 years of his life and uh, wrote, you know, sort of short stories about why people come into therapy. And, um, and his last name is spelled G-R-O-S-Z. Um, and at one point I, I bought this book for every member of my family. Oh. <laughs> and I said, read the book, find yourself, see if you can find yourself and see if you can find someone that you don't like <laughs> and mark the book up, you know? Mm-hmm. And, um, in the preface, he says, you know, people come to therapy for all kinds of reasons. And uh, he relates that a patient came to him and she said, I want to change, but not if it means changing. Mm. Because change means loss. Mm. It means giving up an idea, maybe something that Mm. your family told you about the other. It gives up a fantasy of, you know, maybe I didn't get that promotion whether was it really about something racial or is it about something I did mm. uh, giving up the idea that uh, I'm privileged or that my, my lot in life has just been completely predetermined by just a racist society or how do I deal with the pain I feel for the fact that my parents were never able to achieve because of their race. Mm. Mm. And so, so people come or the inability to love when there's so much hate that they grew up with, mm. like hate this person, hate that person. I'm hearing the N word here, N word there. Walls are built up yeah. over time. Yeah. So, right. so, so I want to talk a little more about this internalization as well and mm. talk about it from a cultural standpoint. So if I'm, African-American and uh, I am taught through these racial ghosts that there's something different about me, uh, there's something, um, you know, uh, unacceptable about uh, the way I am in, in the world. I not only change myself, I suppose, sometimes to, to try to uh, accommodate that, but I enforce those same standards and biases against other people, right? I I export that in a, in addition to internalizing that. Um and and that way it becomes even more than uh than the 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 fruit of a racist uh, uh system. It 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 becomes the 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 cultural capital that moves around inside othered communities like the African-American community. Yes, that could be very, very true. However, there's also the kind of resiliency too. So for instance, if you're growing up in a um, predominantly black, solid neighborhood where the doctor you see is African-American, the dentist, the lawyer, your teachers, and you grow up in that environment mm-hmm. and then you go to, let's say, a predominantly white school or a school where it, it doesn't have that kind of, then you might be much more prepared mm. when someone says to you, hey, how did you get here? Was this some kind of affirmative action thing? It's like, well, no, I you know, got this kind of SAT score. AC. You, 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 you might come in it with much more of a solid base of who you you are are. that can Mm -hmm. mitigate what society is trying to say who you are. 
Well, hold on. And I, I, oh, go yeah, ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Finish your thought. No, no, no. I just I think that that um, in our engagement, mm. people can um, can hold on to a kind of sense of self. It doesn't mm. have to be so absolutely negative. But then, if you have people in school systems, and studies have been shown this that a lot of um, inner city schools, urban schools have young teachers who are, for instance, afraid to teach math. They're afraid of math. Mm -hmm. So you see, if you see uh, you have these young boys and girls really interested in math, and then the teachers giving them because of their own anxiety, typically white, they're giving them, let's read. You watch the child's desire for math dwindle. Mm. So it really does depend on dealing with all of these anxieties, not just racial. And when you think about who's, who are the teachers, what are the experiences that children are gaining mm. throughout their lives to prepare them for the world? And part of the work we've done, we've just recently um, published a three-year study looking at um, systemic racism and the effects of systemic racism in the psychoanalytic community. And it was surveys, it was interviews, it's called the Holmes Commission on Racial Equity, uh, Racial Equality in Psychoanalysis. And uh, we're publishing our work is that even, even in the classroom, when there were completely white teachers and completely white candidates, that's what we call people in psychoanalytic training, there was there were requests, why isn't the curriculum more diverse? Hmm. And there were racial remarks made about why that was, about the quality of the work which is totally not true because the candidates now, are, you know, people are just much more informed. And so, so we're watching as the reality of people's lives, regardless of race, is confronting this old model mm. of who we are, where we are, where we should be. Mm. Mm. I do want to bring back the idea of who we are that we talked about earlier and how the sense that we know who we are can be questioned because we've internalized so much of how our society perceives us. I just want to know the balance and the push and pull because you just outlined how if someone has a strong sense of self, when they go into different communities that other them, they can move through it probably a little bit more more easily, right? But right. how much of that sense of self is who they are considering we know that we are constantly trying to adjust even as a society, which I think what Stephen was trying to bring to, even as a community trying to adjust to the broader definition of how we're perceived. Right. Um, I mean, I think the broader definition of how we're perceived mm -hmm. is, is a fading kind of myth. Okay. 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 I mean, I mean, if you look at everything from sports <laughs> to <laughs> politics, like who could be president, who could be quarterback, who could be a golfer? Who could be a surgeon? Who could be a, a, a lawyer? Um, all of the myths are not the reality. So it was, it was easier to promote a kind of rhetoric when that was true based on the kind of segregation and, and discrimination that was happening. And so what I'm experiencing now mm -hmm. is, is, and I think what we are all experiencing, is confronting, you know, what direction are we going to go in as a society? Mm. This kind of sounds like, well, if I understand you correctly, you're saying these examples of individuals who can be at the highest levels of different fields that come from all different backgrounds are shattering the broader stereotypes of their communities. Is that what you, is that what you were saying? Yes. And I think okay. that also, also what's demanded 
is that instead of just basing, like closing your eyes when the evening news comes on, the <laughs> local news, oh. and having a kind of story in the back of your mind, like who are these people? These are real people. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the recent airman that was shot and killed in Florida, I think in the past 24 hours, that he was an airman, that they were at the wrong location. And but the problem is that we still have to we have to sort of detoxify ourselves. It's mm -hmm. almost like get rid of the kind of cancer actively. And someone said racism is like hypertension. Uh, great Dorothy Holmes, which the Holmes Commission is named after. You know, racism is like hypertension. You can't cure it. You just have to treat it every day. Mm. And that was kind of what I was getting to. It sounds like we are also in a time where those incremental gains are actually making some moves to where folks, as you defined earlier, can have that sense of self, can define themselves as however they choose to be, not based off of how the broader communities other them to be. Yes. Hmm. Yes. Any other final thoughts? But, but, there, oh. but, there, but there's also some resistance to that, right? Because right, yes. Again, it gets to, right. I want to change, but not if it means changing. What does this mean when my mother allowed me to say, oh, a baby nanny, and not correct me? Right. Like, right. yes, our nanny may be Black, but that nanny also may have children who are in medical school or in law school or... You know, so a black person is not just a baby nanny automatically, right? It's right. not just a person that just takes you for your tests or draws your blood. And so, so our ability to see beyond, to take an extra step, to see who we are, mm -hmm. not what was conditioned for us to see through a lens of racism. Yeah. That has to be treated every day. And so, so how do we treat that? I mean, I guess that's my big question is, mm. what do you do to counteract what you're talking about here? I mean, this is, this is again, the weight of 400 years in the case of race, of, of systemic inequality. Uh, do you have do we have any shot at even dulling the effects of this, let alone reversing them? And if so, what does that look like? Wow, that's that's a Nobel Prize winning answer. <laughs> <if you can laughs> <get it. laughs> right, that's right. Let's answer it and then go win the Nobel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I I I mean, I wish it was an easy answer. It's a very complex answer. Yeah, I know. For me, it's it's trying to catch myself. For instance, recently I discovered that something I thought had been stolen was not stolen. Mm. It's just, it was misplaced in a place where I, and I did, I took an action and it was against another racial minority based on what I thought was uh, uh, their uh, taking something from me. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess I'm addressing it now because and I've been addressing <laughs> and telling this story recently a lot because it, it, it speaks to how we can do this so subtly. Mm. Right. And and I think about my medical school and there was a woman who kept coming up to me and I had experience in being in uh, New Orleans. I did a program to help us help, uh, you know, poor and, and uh, diverse people to. Uh, improve their uh, chances of getting into medical school. And so I had been in New Orleans for a summer before starting medical school, or maybe two summers before. And um, this woman kept coming up to me and introducing herself. And I was like, why is this white woman talking to me? And I realized she was not white. She was from New Orleans. Nah. And... Uh, it was my own racial mapping again. Mm -hmm. So I think we do this. The question is, do we just feel guilty about it? Mm -hmm. Or can we acknowledge it mm. and, and give other people a kind of pass and say, you do this too. We all do this. 
Dr. Dion Powell, it was really great to have you with us for this conversation. It was really, really wonderful. Thanks for joining Created Equal. Thank you. Thank you so much. That'll do it for us on Created Equal. Be sure to listen to our recent episodes at WDET.org. And we would love if you would subscribe to our podcast where you can leave us a rating or a review. Created Equal is produced by Carrie Jr. II and David Lines. Our audio editing is done by Connor Anderson. And the music is by Sam Bobian. Created Equal is a production of WDET, a listener-supported service of Wayne State University.